Good morning. It is good to see you. If you are out in the uh, foyer, come on in and find your seat. And uh, we're glad you're here this morning and look forward to a great day of worship. If you're a guest with us today, and I, I think maybe we might have a few, I'm so glad you're here. Would you do me a favor, if you're a guest, would you get onto our website and then go to our the Contact Us page and send us an email that you were here? just so we have a good idea that you are here and, and how we maybe can pray for you. Uh, we would love for you to do that. So we're glad you're here. Listen, a couple of announcements, one really important announcement that I want to mention to you. Um, we are still taking um, supplies, donations for the Crocho schools, all right? And that's, in fact, it's become very important that we receive some of those. And uh, so I want to encourage you that this week, if you can, to swing by here and drop some of those off. We do that every year. And it's a good opportunity for us to serve that school. And so we want to encourage you to do that. Take a few moments. If you're buying school supplies for your kiddos, buy a few extras. Bring them by, and uh, that will mean a lot to the school system over there at Crutcho. So I encourage you to do that. In just a moment, we're going to have a chance to be involved in our backpack blessing. I'm not going to steal the thunder there. It's going to be a great time. So we look forward to participating in that together. I want us to pray together, and then we're going to jump right into our worship, okay? Father, thank you for the day that you have blessed us with. It is a joy to come and be in your house. We are grateful and thankful for the opportunity to worship together. We pray now that you would bless this time, that maybe everything that is said and done will bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Y'all can call me Mr. Jimmy. I tried. Okay, we have these little luggage tags up here on the front row, and I'm going to ask you to come up here in just a few minutes and get a tag or tags uh, for your students. If you want to get some to hand out, that would be great. We would love to have a name back on who all received tags. Uh, they don't have to be in grade school or high school. They can be in college. I'm going to get one for Laramie. She's in PA school. so. We just want the students to know that our church is praying for them. The tags read, this, pack back, this backpack has been blessed by Oakdale Baptist Church who loves, prays, and supports this student. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And that's numbers 6, 24, and 25. So many prayers have been poured into each one of these. I think Sherry told me we have 100 and we're going to order more if we need it. But it all started last Sunday when Justin and Paul and the deacons prayed over the tags. On Tuesday, the ladies' group, the ladies' prayer group, prayed over these tags and over the students and over the teachers. On Wednesday night, or on Tuesday night, the youth group prayed over them as they were working on them. And this weekend, our senior adults prayed over them. And now you're going to have an opportunity to pray for the students and teachers or the students that get these tags. Um, I'm going to ask you to come up and get a tag. And then as justice leads us in prayer, I'm going to ask you to specifically pray for the student who owns the backpack that that tag will be hanging from. You may not even know who that is at this point, but I promise you God does. And so that's how I want us to pray. Justin. So at this time, we want to invite you as Jamie leads us. And we want to invite you to come find a tag here, as many as you need, uh, that are placed on the chairs on the front row. And so if you're ready to do that as Jamie leads us, you are invited to come and grab those now. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. And 
make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 upon and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon
you think it's important? Do you think it's important that every year about this time, as children are about to return to school, as teachers are about to return to school, with uncertain futures and unknown elements and all the stress and the strain and the busyness, do you think it's important every year at this time for us to pray for our children? Yes. And to pray for our educators? And do you think that this year it might be more important than maybe any of us can ever remember? Then let's pray to him right now. Let's ask this prayer over these children, over these students, and over these teachers. Heavenly Father, God, we give thanks to you that we can even come to you. You have told us to seek you and that we will find you when we seek you with all of our hearts. And so, God, our hearts are full this morning with the burden of our children of our students, of our educators, of the just awesome responsibility they carry with them every day. And on a normal year, God, we would pray for them and, and we would just lift them up to you and know that you had such great things in store for them. And God, this year we understand, we recognize that there's so much turmoil and so much chaos and so much unknown, so much stress and strain and burden. And Father, we, we just double our efforts to intercede for those who need you so much right now. Father, we ask your blessings upon the students and adults. We pray that you would keep them safe in your presence, comfort them in your arms. Father, we pray that you would make your face to just shine upon them this year that they would know that they have your favor and that no matter what happens, they will experience your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We ask these blessings in your name and in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Be seated. Well, good morning to you, and I want to thank you for coming and being a part of today, this last Sunday before most of our kids go back to school, and uh, sort of the end of the summertime and the beginning to some degree of the fall, although tell the Oklahoma weather that, and uh, you know, it's just a, it's an important time in the life of our families and our communities and our country. Uh, let me invite you, if you would, as we begin this morning to take out your Bibles, if you have them, and we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. Uh, we also make available to you online our message notes. They're going to look like this. And so if, uh, if you brought those with you, I encourage you to use them to follow along. If you're at home and watching online, uh, I would invite you to print those out or use them however you need to, uh, again, just to help stay on track with what we're trying to learn this morning. We are actually beginning a brand new series today. We ended a long series, a summer series, on faith last week, and this morning we begin a new series called Warning Signs. Now, everybody probably knows what a warning sign is, right? You're likely to find one near a dangerous cliff. You might see one that is warning a bridge is out ahead. Basically, it's just exactly what it sounds like. It's any sign placed for the specific purpose of warning people about danger ahead. And so what we're going to do over the next few weeks is to take a very common image of a warning sign, and we're going to apply it to several different areas of our life. We're going to apply it to a different area each week. And what we're going to do is we're going to see if God didn't have something to say to us about some of the danger zones or the danger areas that we might have been ignoring in our lives. Now, our definition for a warning sign is going to go like this. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. A warning sign for us is going to be a personal standard of behavior based on Scripture that informs our conscience. Now, let's break that down. Let me say it again. I want you to think about each part of that. A warning sign for us is going to be a personal standard of behavior based on Scripture that informs our conscience. And here's what I mean by that. I'm going to encourage you as we talk about your marriage 
your dating life, your relationships, friendships, even time management, to develop a personal standard of behavior that you are so committed to as an individual that you will to symbolically plant a warning sign in those areas of your life so that if you start to violate those standards, these signs will be there to warn you, remind you, and discourage you from going any further. Now, to give you an example of of what a real-life warning sign might look like, we're going to start our series, as I mentioned earlier, in the New Testament book of Ephesians, which is really just a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church in a city called Ephesus. And what you need to know about the Ephesian church is that they lived in a culture, and, and, and it's hard to imagine this, but they lived in a culture that was even more immoral than our culture. Now, listen, we are so, in some ways, inoculated to the conditions that we live in. In some ways, we are so comfortable with what we experience around us, it may be a shock for you to hear me say that we live in an immoral culture. Now, I have one thing on you, I have one thing over you that's sort of the trump card that makes me right and you wrong. You, want, you ready to hear what it is? I'm the preacher, okay? I'm the guy with the sign that says, bridge out ahead. Warning, warning, turn back. It's bad, it's real bad, okay? You don't hear me say stuff like that a lot of the time. But occasionally, I have to yell and scream and spit at you, and today is kind of one of, those, one of those deals. And so, what I'm telling you is, whether you believe it or not, whether you realize it or not, we live, unfortunately, in a very immoral culture. We live in a culture where there is very little right and wrong, very little absolute truth in our culture. And what I'm telling you also is that in Ephesus, it may have been twice as bad. It may have been a hundred times as bad. In fact, some of the things that even we consider, you know, over the line morally, like as crazy as things can get for us, we know there's a line. We would never cross over that as a nation. We would never step up. Now, that line feels like it moves all the time. But at least I think we would agree there is a line. Well, guess what? Some of those things that are on the other side of that line in Ephesus, they were completely acceptable. No big deal. In fact, they were so completely acceptable that when they went to worship, a lot of times they took those immoral things with them and used them in worship. Now imagine what that might look like on a Sunday morning here in the United States. That would, be, that would be insane. That would be crazy. We would never accept that. But in Ephesus, that was very, very acceptable. And so in addressing this culture through this church, Paul goes through a list of, of sort of do's and don'ts. You know, things that, that we would expect. Always be honest. Don't do the kinds of things that are going to destroy your marriage. Always be kind to other people. But at the end of the list, the list actually gets pretty serious, which leads Paul to begin to explain how a person might plant some warning signs around the dangerous areas of their lives. And here's how he begins now in Ephesians 5, verse 15. Just one little short phrase. He says this, be very careful then how you live. Be very careful, then, how you live. Now, the literal translation of this would be, pay very close attention to how you walk. Or, be sure that you walk with purpose. Now, if you're not sure what that means, I want you to think of it like this. If you've ever owned a dog, especially a big dog, that did its business in your backyard, you know exactly what it means to pay very close attention to how you walk. Yes? You know exactly what I mean when I say, hey, you, you back there, barefoot, you better walk with purpose, my friend, right? 
Because you understand there are consequences. Paul is saying, as you live your life and as you walk through relationships with other people, as you deal with money, as you relate to the world around you, you have to pay very, very close attention to how you walk and where you step and how you live. Why? Because I'm telling you, there is danger. And where you walk could bring with it serious, serious consequences. Be very careful then how you live. Then he goes on in the middle of verse 15 and he says this. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. And why should we do this? He says, because the days are evil. Okay? The days are are evil. Paul says, you Ephesians are living in a dangerous, dangerous time. And if you don't pay attention to where you step, you will go off of a cliff. If you don't walk with purpose, you're going to blow yourself up. If you don't do things very, very intentionally, there will be a price to pay. Why? Because the days are evil. Now, Surely, I don't have to spend a lot of time convincing you how dangerous the days are that we live in, especially right now where we're at. Financially, some of you, you, you already had debt, and, and you can't imagine how you got into so much debt, and because of it, you know, you feel like you can't give, and you feel like you can't be generous, and you feel like you can't live the way that you want to live, and that was before the economy ground to a screeching halt last spring, right? I mean, come on, these are dangerous days to live in financially. Nobody really has enough to feel real confident about what comes next. Morally, it's the same thing. In your marriage, it's the same thing. The way you deal with your kids, the way you deal with temptation, we live in a dangerous time. Can I get you to at least nod your head at me? that you agree with that, you gotta feel that way, especially if you're a grandparent or a parent, we live in a dangerous, dangerous day. Paul says you've gotta pay attention, you gotta be purposeful about how you live and how you walk. Verse 17, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And I don't know if, you're, if you've got your Bible open and you're not opposed to it, I would underline that word understand, okay? Or maybe, maybe if you're looking at the Bible on your phone, you can make that bold, understand. This is actually kind of a tricky little phrase where Paul uses a Greek word that gets translated into an English word that really does not make a lot of sense in this context. Think about it. He commands us to understand something. Understand, right? Just do it. Understand it. Only guess what? It's really hard to do. It's really hard to understand something that you don't, fill in the blank, understand, right? I mean, it's just difficult to do. Remember when you were a kid in school, I remember this pretty clearly, and they would call you up to the board. This was always bad news for little Justin, okay? And they'd say, little Justin, you know, I want you to do number three on the board, and, and you know, Paul, you know, whoever, you do number four, and, and you're up there at the board, and you got your math book, and you know, you're thinking, I'm in big trouble here. And, you, and for me, you know, I always felt like honesty was the best policy. <laughs> and so I would say, this would be my approach, I would say to the teacher, you know, look, I don't really know how to do problem number three. And imagine your teacher looking at you or looking at me and saying, understand, <laughs> right? Oh, oh, <laughs> right? Oh, under, you just want me to understand. How do you command somebody to understand? And, and by the way, did you notice what he is commanding us to understand? If you look back, he was saying, understand what the Lord's will is. Well, how many of us have spent most of our life trying to figure that out? And you just want us to understand, Paul? Well, here's the deal. That's not exactly what Paul was trying to do. When he says, understand the Lord's will, he's not commanding us to grasp something that, that we don't have any way of knowing, he is actually challenging us to admit something we already know but may not like 
and therefore do not want to admit. Now, does that sound a little more? Yes, that sounds a lot more like it, doesn't it? Here's what he's trying to say to you and to me. Paul says, I want you to face up to, I want you to accept, I want you to embrace what you already know in your heart and in your mind. God's will for your life as it relates to your money, your marriage, your dating life, your friendships, to the way you spend your time. You live in a dangerous culture, in a dangerous age. You've got to quit flirting with disaster and face up to what you know in your heart God wants you to do and not do, okay? And then he gives us an illustration of what he's talking about. And here it is in verse 18. Do not, he says, get drunk on wine. Do not get drunk on wine. Now, before I give you this full illustration, I got to tell you some things. Full, full disclosure for me. I don't drink alcohol. And that's probably not a big surprise to anybody. The reason that I don't drink isn't because I think it's a sin. In fact, I believe the Bible is pretty clear that it is not a sin to consume alcohol. But for me, I have planted a warning sign, if you will, in my life and in the life of my family next to alcohol. And there are three reasons why for me. Number one, I, I don't enjoy admitting this, but it's the truth. I spent a season of life as a young teenager basically medicating myself with alcohol to try to fill the emptiness that was inside of me. That emptiness got filled finally when I became a Christian. But I experienced something very, very ugly and something I would never want for my own children and something I don't want for your children. And so that's one of the reasons why I have a big warning sign next to alcohol in my life. Number two, I have seen the lives of too many people I cared about destroyed by the danger that comes with alcohol. And number three, I have no way of knowing in any given situation who around me is an alcoholic that I am making life miserable for without even knowing it or meaning to, okay? And so, a long time ago, I planted uh, just a sign next to alcohol that says, warning, danger ahead, all right? So understand, this is actually, this is a very illustration, very easy illustration that Paul gives for me to grasp. It may not be for everybody. But Paul uses the example of alcohol to say, you know what, let us all wake up and be honest. We all know that on the other side of this sign is danger. And so he says, do not get drunk on wine. And then he tells us why, which leads to debauchery. Well, now that clears it up, right? I mean, how many of you in the last few weekends were just debauched? Any, any debauchers here? Please don't point at other people. I'm, I'm purely asking you, okay? Now, we don't, I, I don't think we even really know what that word means. I mean, we, if, if we've ever heard it, we know it's bad. We know it's real bad. Uh, it sounds bad, but we don't exactly know what it means. Now, I'm going to give you the definition for debauchery in a minute, but I don't want you to miss this, okay? Paul is explaining to us that drunkenness is a warning sign. In other words, Paul is saying, Christian, I don't want you to get drunk. And although getting drunk is foolish and getting drunk is, is irresponsible and getting drunk is dangerous, that's not the reason you shouldn't get drunk. He says, the reason I want you to decide that you are not going to drink alcohol until you get drunk is because getting drunk leads to something, listen to me, far more dangerous that you do not want to be a part of, which of course is debauchery. All right, good, debauchery. But what is debauchery? Well, here's the sort of official definition of debauchery. It's extreme indulgence that results in a loss of control. That sound about right? 
extreme indulgence that results in, might even say, a total loss of control. Now, as you read the Bible, you discover that whether it's lust, alcohol, greed, anger, food, material possessions, anything in our lives that leads us to a loss of control that baits us towards things that we don't need to be involved in to where we're so lustful we can barely control ourselves, to where we're so greedy we can hardly control ourselves. I want that house so badly I'm willing to sacrifice my kid's education in order to get it. Anything in our life that draws us to a point where we just totally lose control, your heavenly father is against and defines as sin. And do you know why? Because he's mean. No. Because he doesn't want us to have any fun. Because I'm pretty sure all the fun is on the other side of that warning sign. Can I get an amen to that? I'm pretty sure all the fun is over there in the debauchery zone. And that's where I want to be. Or at least I want to dip my little toe in occasionally without having to feel judged by you, God, okay? Paul says, any area, any area of your life where you lose control is something that God is not pleased with. Because extreme indulgence that results in a loss of control results in, hear me now, pain and destruction for you and the people you love. And there's a whole bunch of us right here this morning that if, 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 we, if we did, if we were willing, I'm not asking you to, but we could raise our hand and we could tell the story, couldn't we? Of the pain and the destruction that we have seen in our own life and the lives of people we care about. And, and by the way, understand, debauchery is not just about drunkenness. It's not just about sex, okay? This can be debauchery too, right? Anybody with me on this? Yeah. Or how about this? Could the way you raise your kids be considered debauchery? Think about it. Extreme indulgence that results in loss of control. Could that be debauchery? You better believe it. And so what Paul is saying is this. Any area of your life where you have the, ten the tendency to hand control over to somebody or something, you need to plant a big warning sign right there in front of it. Paul says, pay attention and be purposeful about how you walk because the days in which we live are very, very dangerous. You want an example? I'll give you one. Don't get drunk. Why? Because it leads to a loss of control and that loss of control is a sin against your heavenly father. And if we're being honest, the loss of control has led us to some of our greatest regrets in life. Or maybe a loss of control in someone else's life has led to a disaster in your life. So Paul says, don't do anything that leads you to a point where you just cannot control yourself. And then listen to what he contrasts that with. This is one of the things I love about Scripture. I find it from the very beginning to the very end. I can't think of an example where God says... Don't do this, and then that's the end of the story. Over and over and over and over, the testimony of God's word is, don't do this, but here's what you can do. Here's what you can replace that with, because guess what? I, God, created it all. Therefore, all of it has a godly side to it. So don't do this, but here's what you can replace that with. This is the middle of verse 18. He says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And I said earlier that I spent a season of my life trying to fill the emptiness in me. And guess what ultimately ended up filling that emptiness? The Spirit of my Heavenly Father. You see, the Bible teaches 
that when you become a Christian, the Spirit of God actually comes to live inside of you and that the Holy Spirit inside of you will prompt you, will guide you, will direct you, and will convict you. Now, the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit in my experience never yells, never screams. The Holy Spirit usually goes, <clears throat> you know what I'm talking about? That's about it. And I don't know about you, that's usually all I need. I don't need the Holy Spirit to yell at me most of the time. I just need a, <clears throat> and that's all it takes. You see, the Holy Spirit, now this is, this is sort of, I'm, I'm giving you something I believe here. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit is our conscience, but I believe the Holy Spirit elbows us in the conscience from time to time, okay? Which is why we already know what we ought and ought not do. And that is why Paul says this. He says, come on, your life is too important. Time is too short. The world that we live in is too dangerous. Pay attention, be purposeful about where and how you walk. Now, here's what I know about all of us. None of us plan to mess up our lives, right? We, we don't plan to do it. Nobody has ever stood at the altar saying their vows and in the back of their mind are thinking, man, I cannot wait to get married because I am really going to mess this up. I mean, it is just going to be a disaster. You think you've seen some bad marriages? Just wait. This is going to be the worst one ever. Now, no one thinks that, right? That, that's never anybody's plan, I hope. Although I have stood in front of a, some couples sometimes, and I wondered. But I don't think anybody thinks that. And yet, let's face reality. That's true on one side. But the other side is people mess up their marriages all the time, don't they? Or at least their marriages get messed up all the time. So here's the conclusion I've come to. Nobody ever plans to mess up a marriage, but a lot of people never plan not to. Are you with me? In other words, they never plan to drive their marital car right over the edge of a giant cliff. But they also never set up a system of warning signs in their marriage that would sort of warn them to, to tap the brakes from time to time or deter them from danger that is ahead. Does that make sense? And the same thing I think is true for a lot of different areas in our life. Nobody plans to mess up their bodies physically, but a lot of people have because they never really planned not to. And so consequently, your heavenly father, because he loves you so much, he says, look, I want you to be honest with yourself about what I want for your life. I want you, because you live in a dangerous world and in an evil day, to set up a system of warning signs around the dangerous parts or the dangerous areas of your life, personal standards based on my word that inform your conscience of what you ought and ought not to do. So that when you begin to get close to the edge of a cliff, morally, personally, physically, spiritually, your warning signs will be there to help steer you away from danger. And, and let me just ask you again, as a grandparent, as a parent, are you, can you honestly sit here and raise your hand and tell me today that you don't want that for your children? that you don't want that for your grandchildren. You can't. There's no way if you love them, and I know that you do. So for us as individuals, we've got to understand how important that is for us as well because we have a Heavenly Father that wants the same thing for us. So here's the commitment that we're going to talk about and I'm going to try to help you make over these coming weeks. Here's, here's what it's going to look like. Let me show it to you. We must establish warning signs in the danger zones of our lives. Here's the, here's the key, ahead of time, okay? Without even explaining it, do you know why 
ahead of time is so important, ahead of time, so that we don't pay the price that comes with losing control. Now, I'm not asking you to make that commitment necessarily right now, but what I'm asking you is this, does that make sense? Does that make sense to anybody? And again, you don't have to raise your hand. Does that make sense to anybody because of experience you've had in the past? Does that make sense to anybody because you know what your nature is? I do. Does that make sense because you have seen other people not do this and it end up having a terrible impact on your life, right? So here's how I wanna finish today. As I've been talking this morning about these different areas of our life, I'm thinking that for some of you, something very specific probably came to mind as a danger zone in your life. I may have mentioned it, or I may not have. It may have been alcohol. It may have had nothing whatsoever to do with alcohol. But you know that there's an area in your life where you are just barreling down on the edge of a cliff and you need to plant some warning signs based on God's word that will keep you away from the danger. It may be something financially that you're doing or not doing. It may be something in a relationship Whatever it is, as you've listened to the message this morning, is there something inside of you going? <clears throat> Listen to me now. That is the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. It's your Heavenly Father saying, I'm not trying to keep you from something good. I'm trying to rescue you from something bad. You've got to plant and pay attention to the warning signs in your life, okay? So, what would it look like in some dangerous areas of your life to sort of put your foot on the brakes and maybe put up some warning signs planted in the ground that maybe none of your friends or, or anybody in your office or maybe even in your family would ever understand. They look at you and be like, what? You don't need that. Come on, that's ridiculous. But it could be the one thing that God uses to rescue you from something that could destroy you or someone you love. I do not know what that is for you. But while I've been talking, I have a feeling some things have come into your mind. My hunch is that whatever came immediately to your mind, that's probably where God would like to start with you in your life, okay? And by the way, you don't need you know, five more messages on this to get started either. Because chances are you already know exactly where you need to plant that warning sign. You already know where you need a personal standard of behavior based on scripture that informs your conscience. Let's pray about it together. Let's seek our Heavenly Father. Let's admit what those dangerous areas are and let's ask him to give us some help in the form of his word, of his Holy Spirit, of people around us. Let's ask for his help. Heavenly Father, God, we, we just come to you and recognize that we struggle sometimes to stay out of the danger zones, the, 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 the scary areas of our life, the edges of cliffs, because we have this sense that that's where the fun is. But God, we also know if we've lived very long that a lot of times when we have ignored the warnings, God, that's where we have the biggest regrets in our life. I just pray for us this morning that maybe today would be different for us, that as you sort of clear your throat, and you elbow our conscience that we would recognize that it's you speaking to our hearts and our minds. And you're saying to us, I love you. I love you, and I want to protect you. It's not that I want to keep things from you. I created a whole world for you to enjoy. But there's a godly side, and there's a not-so-godly side to everything. And I want you to plant some warning signs in your life around the areas that have the potential to be the most dangerous for you. 
God, will you just take that word, will you take that idea, will you make that real in our heart and in our brain? And whatever it is that for each one of us that has come to mind when we think about these areas where we need to tap the brakes, God, would you help us to begin immediately to deal with that, to seek you for help on that, to make a commitment to your word so that you might protect us. God, what an amazing relationship you offer that we can even ask this of you. Because you could just zap us out of existence the first time we messed up. But that's the last thing you would do, isn't it? Thank you, God, that you love us like this. May we be pleasing to you now as we are obedient to you now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing. Let's worship. Let's consider how God would have us be obedient today. deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch's treasure, how great the pain of searing loss, the father turned face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory Jesus paid it all all to him my own
We want to thank you for being with us today, whether here physically or online. Thank you for worshiping with us and studying and hopefully growing with us. And just want to once again say, let's be in prayer for our kids, our students, our teachers as they begin a new school year. Let's bathe them in prayer. You guys have a great week. We look forward to worshiping with you next time. Thanks. You're dismissed.